Here we show spheres of mass 10 and 3 kilograms immediately before colliding. Here are the final velocities of the spheres just after colliding. Now, I'm showing the forces on the two spheres during the collision. We have seen this notation before. FBA is the force on B due to A. FAB is the force on A due to B. Again, there are no external forces acting on the system. Now these forces may vary during the collision. So we have to consider the notion of the average force on each sphere. So FAB stands for the average force on A. So by Newton's second law, that's the mass of A, I plug in the numbers later, times the average acceleration of A. So this stands for the average acceleration of A. So the acceleration is varying with time, obviously, if the force is varying with time. The mass doesn't change, of course. Let's get the average acceleration during the collision. Well, that's the change in velocity during the collision. So VA is the velocity of sphere A immediately after the collision and UA is the velocity of sphere A immediately before the collision. T is the time taken for the collision. Now T is an extremely small number and we plug in a, a typical value for T later. Now the impulse imparted to an object is defined to be the average force on the object multiplied by the time that that force acts on the object. So I call the impulse capital I and we just multiply this thing by the time of the collision. Well, that, that will just cancel the t in the denominator. Now, we've seen this kind of thing before when we derived the conservation of momentum for two colliding spheres. Notice that we get the change in momentum of sphere A. We get the momentum immediately after the collision minus the momentum immediately before the collision. So you see, the impulse imparted to an object by a force does not depend on the time. The time doesn't come into it, so it doesn't matter how long the force is acting. It could be 0 0.01 of a second or it could be a microsecond. You know, it could be 10 hours. Makes no difference what this value of t is, as long as these values don't change. The impulse is fixed. Now, of the, in the case of two colliding spheres, obviously t is going to be an extremely small number. However, for analysing problems, we don't need to know the time of collision. You know, we can just, it's only the change in momentum that matters. So in general, we don't know what the force is. OK, let's pl plug in some numbers. Now, the mass of sphere A is 10. Its initial velocity is 4 meters per second to the right, so I'll take directions to the right as positive. Its uh, final velocity is 3 meters per second to the right. OK, so the change in momentum is minus 10, so the momentum of sphere A decreases. That makes sense because it's, it slows down. It slows down from a speed of 4 to 3 meters per second. It loses momentum. Now momentum is a vector, so this momentum would be pointing to the left. And have magnitude 10. Now what are the units? Well, um, the units of impulse are the same as the units of momentum because impulse is just a difference of two momenta. So mass is in kilograms, speed is in meters per second. However, we can use a, a different unit from, we, we can write this differently because we're multiplying a force by a time. The unit of force is the Newton, the unit of time is second. So we could write the unit of impulse as Newton second. And as a reminder, that makes sense because the Newton as units of kilograms meters per second squared. This comes from Newton's second law. The resultant force is mass times acceleration. Mass is unit of kilograms acceleration is unit of meters per second squared. So if we multiply Newtons by seconds, we multiply seconds by this quantity. Kilograms meters s to the minus 2 by s to the minus w s to the 1, so that's s to the minus 1. Now what about the impulse imparted to B during the collision? So we need to get the average force on B. Well, that's FBA. 
that's the average resultant force on B, because there are no external forces, or if there are external forces, they cancel out to zero. Um, so here's the resultant force on B. It's entirely due to A, multiplied by the time of the collision. But this is where we apply Newton's third law, of course. So if we go back up to this picture here. These two forces have the same magnitude. Okay, regardless of the relative size of the spheres or how fast one of them is moving compared to the other, Newton's third law says that these forces are equal in magnitude. So FBA is minus FAB. Okay, the minus sign means we s switch the direction. So we take um, FAB and minus it, so it switches the direction but doesn't change the magnitude. So we just take the negative of the impulse imparted to A. So we negate minus 10. So obviously the impulses are equal but opposite. Now let's get the force on sphere B. And then suppose that the time taken for the collision was 300 microseconds. That's a millionth of a second. So basically, we just divide this quantity by t to get rid of the to get rid of the t. So we're left at newtons. Okay, so we have ten newton seconds divided by the time in seconds. Three hundred microseconds is three hundred by ten to the minus six of a second. Okay, so there's the force on sphere B, and uh, of course, Newton's third law tells us that the force on sphere A. It just got by negating this. Again, I should say that these forces are averages. There's no reason to assume that the force during the collision is a constant force.